Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar today entitled The Basics of Breast Implant Removal. This is a continuing discussion that we've had. Uh, we've already posted several um, videos so that you can learn as much information as you can about this topic. Uh, this is a topic that is not widely uh, known about or accepted by the medical community. So we are trying to get as much information out to you as possible. My name is Linda Haas. I am the CEO of the Lu Jean Fang Clinic, and I've worked with Dr. Fang for the past 18 years. We started together at Mount Sinai Medical Center of Cleveland and then moved into our new facility in the eastern suburbs of Cleveland called the Lu Jean Fang Clinic. This is a total health and wellness center. This is where Dr. Fang performs all of her outpatient surgeries. So we've been here since the year 2000. Dr. Fang has performed several thousand surgeries here, many of which are um, bilateral breast implant and capsule removal surgeries. So she has a vast amount of experience, in fact, more than 28 years. Joining me today to moderate is our Director of Marketing, Alex Sear. Alex, are you here? I am here and happy to be so. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to um, ask any other questions that may come in during the webinar, but let's get started. The first question I have uh, was presented. Looks like he came from California. How many um, explantation surgeries has Dr. Fang performed? Of course, I just answered the question, literally thousands. Couldn't even give you a number, but Dr. Fang has been performing this surgery since the year probably 1988. So several thousand of these procedures have been performed. So she really has perfected the way she does the procedure. Does Dr. Fang put implants in patients who inquire? And the answer to that question is no. Very simply, she is very much opposed to breast implants because of what she witnesses through the many, many patients who come to her from all over the country, all over the world, who are, have developed some type of an inflammatory reaction. So she's not a proponent of breast implants. She would prefer to use a more natural uh, means to increase breast volume, such as her natural breast enhancement using your own fat tissue and your regenerative adult stem cells. Why hasn't Dr. Fang written a book about her experience with implants? Well, that's a very good question, and I think it boils down to time. Uh, Dr. Fang is a very busy surgeon. Um, she has limited time, and uh, therefore she really uh, has not had the opportunity or the luxury to sit down and be able to put her thoughts down and write a book. However, she has published many papers uh, in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, she's done many scientific studies. Uh, in fact, many of her papers uh, you can look up on our website, but uh, we deal with the problems with the breast implants, including the analysis of risk factors associated with rupture of silicone gel breast implants, uh, lymphocytes associated with the inflammatory reaction to silicone gel breast implants, uh, shared patterns of gene expression in silicone breast implant capsules and remote sites of tissue inflammation, uh, another one, pathology of lymph nodes from patients with breast implants. So there are a number of scientific papers that have been published, that have been peer-reviewed, uh, that state the facts behind the problems associated with these devices. Can the explant surgery ever be done under local anesthesia? The answer is no, not if we're doing the unblocked procedure, which is where we're removing the entire capsule with the implant contained within. The reason is because we need the patient to be resting comfortably. Uh, we need to know they're not going to be moving during the surgery. It's a very tedious surgery to separate this thin membrane, sometimes it can be thick, away from your healthy breast tissue. But when you consider that Dr. Fang is operating above your heart and your lungs, it's very, very important that you are under general anesthesia resting comfortably, we're constantly monitoring your vital signs so you're in a very safe state at all times, 
and all of our anesthesiologists are board certified doctors. So you're in very good hands having surgery with us. What does Dr. Feng do to prepare her patients for surgery? Well, this is a very important point, is that our patients have to be well informed and educated prior to the surgery because part of the healing process involves the patient and part involves the physician. So we go to great lengths to make sure that our patients are well informed and that they understand that there are certain foods, medications, supplements, even herbal remedies that are not safe to have in your system at least two weeks before your procedure. So we provide information so that patients are aware. Uh, this helps to minimize bleeding. And of course, if we can minimize bleeding, that's less risk for the patient, less trauma, and a much easier recovery. We also provide all of our surgery patients with a high potency, all natural, medical grade multivitamin, which is very important to help boost the immune system, prepare the body for surgery, and help to heal faster afterwards. We provide supplements as well, bromelain and Arnica Montana. These are also very important in terms of helping to reduce inflammation and swelling. How far out does Dr. Fang book surgery? Well, as most of you know, just from your own research or from trying to call our clinic and, and get a return phone call, we are quite busy. And, you know, I apologize for the delay in recontacting people, being able to get back to you. We really are trying to make every effort we can. This is why we wanted to do this webinar, to be able to at least provide you with information. But Dr. Fang's surgery schedule is typically booked about four to five months out. Now, I know that sounds like an eternity, but we really try to work with each and every patient. And if someone is in severe pain or in great need of having this surgery, we really go to great lengths to make sure that we try to do everything we can to get them in sooner. So we maintain what's called a priority wait list. One of the other questions is, how do you get on the list? And is it really likely that we'll be able to get in sooner? The answer is yes. Um, when you consider that someone is scheduling surgery four to five months out, oftentimes there are things that they overlook or forget about that have to do with their children or possibly their spouses or their jobs. And so it's not unusual to have several um, patients who change their appointments uh, a couple weeks before the surgery when they realize it's really not going to work with their schedule. So it is possible that if you get on the list that we can get you in sooner and we make every effort to do so. So the other question was, how likely is it that I can get moved up on that list? Let me tell you how the list works. We try to prioritize um, by need, meaning that if I have a patient who is, has gotten, let's say, contracture of their implants, they're in a lot of pain and discomfort, uh, they have a lot of inflammation. And then I have another patient who really has very mild symptoms, it, maybe not even sure they're having a reaction to their implants, but wants them out and is very anxious and really doesn't want to wait. I'm going to prioritize and give the benefit to that person who really is in pain. We don't like to see anybody suffer. And so that's basically how we create our list. And I go right down the list and call patients as we get openings. And the first patient that I'm able to reach is the one that hopefully will be able to make the arrangements to come sooner. So, uh, you know, again, we get an opening, we have a list, we go down that list, even though you may be the fourth or fifth name on the list, you may be the only person that afternoon that happens to be able to answer the phone and is also available to come at the time of the op opening. So, excuse me. Um, does Dr. Fang ever just remove capsules? even if my implants have already been removed. Yes, she does. And this is kind of an unfortunate situation because this is an indication that someone has had an inflammatory reaction to their implants. The implants more than likely have not been removed thoroughly, meaning that the entire capsule wasn't removed with the implant. And we all know that's where many of the inflammatory cells reside. So it's absolutely imperative that if someone is having a reaction, that in order to stop that reaction, 
all remnants of implant material must be removed in their entirety. Um, and the best way to do that, again, is the end block technique where the entire capsule is carefully dissected away from your healthy breast tissue with the implant inside of it. So when someone calls me and they say, I had my implants removed six months ago, my symptoms got worse, I'm not getting any better, what do you think's wrong with me? We don't know for sure, but we always ask to see the operative report and the pathology report, which is really an indication of exactly what was done and whether or not that capsule really was removed. Oftentimes what we see is that the most difficult part of the capsule, which is typically on the back side of the implant, it's adhered to the chest wall, it's a difficult dissection for someone who has not done a lot of these surgeries because it can be very bloody. So uh, this is something that Dr. Fang is very skillful at, removing every bit of that capsule in its entirety. In fact, there has never been a time that I can recall in the 18 years that I've worked with her where she's walked out of the operating room and said, I just couldn't get all the capsule out. It was stuck. Oftentimes it is stuck, but she will work until she gets it out. So getting back to the original question, do we remove capsules without implants? The answer is yes, we do. And the next question was, is that a less uh, invasive procedure than removing the implant and capsule together? No, it's not. It's just as difficult. In fact, in some cases, it's more difficult because once the implant is removed, that capsule just kind of shrivels up and grows into your breast tissue. So it's actually more difficult to try to get it out. Um, this procedure also has to be done under general anesthesia. Uh, in fact, if someone has a history of multiple sets of implants, we know they're going to have multiple sets of capsules. So all the capsules have to be removed. And that's what Dr. Fang does. Uh, I have heard that it is difficult to reach Dr. Fang after surgery. What if I have questions? Well, Dr. Fang is a very busy surgeon. She's a very compassionate surgeon, though, and that's why she surrounds herself with professionals. We have an excellent team to support her. We have a staff of 34 people that work here in her clinic, nurses, anesthesiologists, uh, administrative staff, and we are all here to help patients. Um, if you have a question, you're a patient of Dr. Fang's, and you're trying to get your an something answered after surgery, the best thing to do, don't email Dr. Fang directly because she gets probably a couple hundred emails every day. So it's time consuming for her just to sort through it and be able to respond to everyone. The best way is just call our clinic. Call our toll-free number, 877-323-FENG. We will help you. We are here to help you. Um, most of our staff will be able to answer a question for you. If they can't answer the question, I can assure you they will get the answer and they will call you back or make sure that Dr. Fang reaches you later in the day after surgery. So there's always a way to get something answered or resolved simply by calling us. Uh, we're here to serve you. How are Lyme disease and breast implant illness related? Well, the symptoms are very similar. In fact, in some cases, it's tough to distinguish, is it really the Lyme problem or is it the implant problem? But one thing we can say for sure is that both implant illness and Lyme disease create tremendous inflammation in the body. So if you've got both going on at the same time, it's, it's a problem because you have even more inflammation. When people are experiencing severe symptoms and they have Lyme disease, and they also have implants. Um, the best thing to do is eliminate the foreign object in your body first, above all else, give your body its best chance to get well. We do find from experience that when people have severe Lyme disease and a foreign object in the body, it does interfere with the healing process and they don't really respond to their treatments well. So give your body its best chance to heal. How do I know for sure that it's my implants that are making me sick? This is a very common question that I hear all the time. A lot of women are very happy with the way they look, uh, but not so happy with the way they feel. And that can be very problematic to determine 
what the real cause is. But for the most part, by the time they've called our office, they have been to many different specialists. They've had many, many different tests done only to find out there's nothing wrong with you. You know, you're, you're imagining this. And uh, they're given antidepressants and so forth. And you know the story. I'm sure many of you have been there. Um, it's the symptoms that really are the biggest indicator. The seven most common symptoms that we see over and over again are numbness and tingling in the extremities, hair loss, brain fog, dry eyes or blurred vision, joint and muscle pain, fatigue, anxiety, breathing problems. The list goes on and on, but those are the most common. And you don't necessarily have to have all those symptoms, but if you have two or more of those symptoms and you never had them before the implants, then there's a very strong possibility that it is in fact the implants that are causing the problem, especially if you've already been to many doctors and you've been tested for many other disease processes. Um, commonly what I hear is that uh, patients are being told, well, you know, it, it looks like maybe fibromyalgia, it could be lupus, you have lupus-like symptoms, but you're not testing positive for lupus, could be Lyme, but, you know, you're not really uh, testing positive on all strands, so, you know, we're really not sure. Um, if those are the kind of answers that you're getting and you do have implants, um, strong possibility it is, in fact, the implants, and the reality is this. We can't say 100% for sure that it is the implants that are making you sick. All we can say is, based on doing thousands of these procedures, based on having patients from every state in the U.S. and from over 31 countries around the world, we see this is a very common problem. And we do know from experience that when the implants are removed thoroughly and properly, the symptoms do go away for most of our patients. Um, the ones that have the most difficult time during recovery are the patients that are the least healthy. Maybe they're smokers. Uh, maybe they have other disease processes going on. So those are some of the things that come into play. But for the most part, um, an otherwise healthy individual who gets implants, who experiences symptoms, will get well after the uh, implants and capsules are removed thoroughly and properly. What is your experience with insurance companies paying for this type of surgery. Not good. The reality is, is that if your insurance company didn't pay to put the implants in, they're not going to pay to take them out. That's been our experience. But wouldn't you know that about two weeks ago, we did have a patient who came and she filed a claim. This is something we don't do. We can provide you with the, the codes and all the necessary information you need but um, we're not a provider for any major insurance companies just because it would become too problematic with uh, dealing with so many insurance companies from all over the country. However, if you're persistent and you want to file a claim, we'll provide you with all the information you need to make it possible. Um, we just had someone who received a 100% reimbursement, which is highly unusual. But So I can't say that it never happens, but the majority of time it's, it's a tough it's a tough sell. They are looking for medical necessity. You know, it's hard enough to try to get your own doctor to tell you that your implants may, may be causing you the problems that you're experiencing, let alone trying to convince the insurance company. So um, it, it, it's very difficult. Um, why do some women react and some don't? Well, that's a very good question. The analogy that I always like to make is why do some siblings within the same family have allergies and the others don't? It really depends on the immune system. Everyone is different. You know, we're not all carbon copies of each other. So some people are a little bit more sensitive than others. What we found, um, our experience has been that those individuals who are more chemically or environmentally sensitive, people who already have allergies, people who already have sensitivities, um, Older women who are maybe postmenopausal, those are typically the population of women who have this type of a reaction. Not always, though. We have many, many very young, early 20s, healthy uh, fitness instructors, yoga instructors, 
who put implants in and get sick immediately. So it's just really hard to say. It comes down to your immune system. So not everybody does react. Dr. Fang does believe, however, if you leave the implants in long enough, eventually everybody will develop some type of a reaction because we all know they continue to deteriorate in the body over time. In fact, Dr. Fang's uh, paper, which again you can access on our website, analysis of risk factors associated with the rupture of silicone gel breast implants, she did a study over a seven-year time frame on thousands of implants that she had removed. And she was able to prove that at 10 years of age, 60% of all implants have already developed a hole or a tear and have began to, begun to leak. So that's kind of shocking when many of you have already been told that these implants would probably last you a lifetime in your body. Um, and of course, you know, doctors today are not saying that, but they are telling women that at about 10 years of age, you know, they really should think about changing them out. And the reason is because they do deteriorate in the body over time. They become weaker and weaker and weaker. And it could be the airbag that goes off in the car. It could be a mammogram, some compression on that already compromised surface that causes the hole of the tear to occur. How long does it take for the breast to look normal again after explantation surgery? That's a good question. It depends on the healing process, and the healing process varies. Um, there are three phases of healing, and this is something that's very, very important to understand. You have the inflammatory phase, and this is where the workers come in with the demolition crews, and they're trying to clean up after the trauma, the trauma being the surgery. This uh, inflammatory phase lasts one to two weeks, and this is when the most swelling exists, the most inflammation in the breast exists. So because there's a lot of healing going on, you know, these workers are in there. They're trying to build scaffolding. They're trying to rebuild all the demolition and make it better. So for one to two weeks, you've got, you know, a lot of swelling going on. What happens with swelling? Swelling causes distortion. So the breasts don't look very good the first two weeks, I can tell you that. But from that point on, we move into another phase, which is called the proliferative phase. And the proliferative phase can also be called the tight phase. And this phase lasts from two weeks, could last up to three to four months. And during this phase, this is where the body is really working hard, trying to produce collagen to help with the healing process. And there is more scar tissue buildup during this phase than that initial one to two week phase. So now the scar tissue is starting to build up. And what do you think happens? There's pulling, there's maybe some indentations in the breasts. And this is where patients start to get panicky. Because again, the breasts don't look normal yet, but they don't realize that this process can last up to four months because the body's going through tremendous changes trying to heal. So this is the tight phase. And again, this goes from two weeks up to four months. And then we get into the remodeling phase. And the remodeling phase starts at about four months, but it can last up to one year. Everybody is different. Some people heal much faster than others, but sometimes it takes up to a year. And oftentimes when we have a patient call and they're just so upset because they're just unhappy with the way their breasts look because they, they see dents and they see distortion, we tell them, please be patient because this can take several months, but I guarantee you, what you see at four months, you aren't going to see at eight months, and you aren't going to see at a year. And we know that because we have photographs to prove it. But this is the remodeling phase, and this is where the, some of the collagen is taken down by the enzymes, and the, the tissue becomes softer, and the scars become softer at this phase. And now the scars start to flatten out. So again, that middle phase is the tricky phase, and that's where you have to be the most patient. So if you see someone post their pictures online and the breasts look really, really bad, and they're very upset, the first thing you have to do is really provide them with some support and tell them, just be patient, be patient. This is what we try to tell all of our patients, because this can be a very difficult time 
but it will pass and it does get better. Okay. Um, is it possible to combine any other procedures, surgical procedures at the time of the explantation surgery? And oftentimes I do have women who do ask about maybe a, t a tummy tuck or, uh, you know, they want to do their eyes or they want to some other procedure. The answer is no. When we're dealing with someone who has inflammation in their body, inflammation interfer interferes with healing. So we want to get you through this difficult period, get you well, and then you can think about doing other procedures. Um, it's especially not good to combine procedures in areas that are not really connected to the breast. So, you know, certainly we wouldn't want to do something on your face or your eyes and be doing the breasts as well because that just really makes it difficult for the body to try to heal. You're trying to build as many, you know, blood cells as possible to go to the wound site to help heal. And, you know, they're going here, there, and everywhere. So the answer is no. Let's focus on this one problem, get you well, and then you can do whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, why doesn't Dr. Fang have more before and after explantation photos on her website to show? Good question. Uh, and this is how I answer this question. And I'm asked this all the time. Can you send me more photos? It's very difficult to, you know, no two breasts look alike. And when you don't know the history behind the breasts you're looking at, whether or not they've breastfed several babies, whether they've had multiple sets of implants, whether maybe they had one set of implants, but they were 750 cc implants, which damages breast tissue, you know, you don't know the circumstances. And so it's difficult to be able to just take a visual and show someone else because that may create false hope or false expectations. Say, well, I want my breasts to look like that. How come mine don't look like that? You have to really understand the history behind the breast. This is a very, very complex procedure. You know, removing implants and trying to make the breasts look good. And Dr. Fang is masterful at doing this. But again, she's, she's not a magician. She's only as good as what she has to work with. And you can be assured that she will do the best possible job on making the breasts look good. Also, maintaining nipple sensation and the ability to be able to breastfeed because these are very, very important issues to most women. Uh, let's see, what, what does Dr. Fang do in her spare time? Geez, I don't think she has spare time. Well, I do know though, Dr. Fang never stops reading and researching. Um, or exercising, I would have to say in her spare time, if she's not in the clinic doing surgery, seeing patients um, at her desk, I would have to say uh, she is down in the fitness center working out with her trainer. She's doing a fitness class. She loves exercise. So Dr. Fang is all about health and wellness. So uh, she's either exercising, she's doing research, she's conducting a study right now on uh, breast implant symptoms so she's pretty heavily involved in all those things. But, you know, I can tell you one thing for sure she's not doing. She's not traveling. She's not gardening because um, she just doesn't have time to do that. So, um, okay. So uh, why does Dr. Fang use drains? And is it possible that I could go home after surgery and have a local doctor remove my drains? The answer to that question is no. And that's really uh, uh, would be a serious problem for us to allow a patient after surgery to have another physician take the bandages down for the first time after surgery and remove those drains. Because who's responsible if something goes wrong? Who's responsible if there's, heaven forbid, an infection? Um, who takes responsibility? Um, when you think about it, and, and when I'm asked that question, I say that would be negligence on behalf of the surgeon to allow that to happen. Um, sure, it's more convenient for the patient, but it's really not in the patient's best interest, nor, did it, nor is it in the surgeon's best interest. And it all boils down to responsibility and liability and safety for the patient. So when we remove the drains, typically with saline implants, it's two to three days before the drains are ready to come out. With gel implants, it's three to four days. So when the patient comes back in to have the drains removed, that's a very, very, very important time because that's the first time 
the patient is going to see those breasts without implants. That can be a very traumatic time. That's also the time when the surgeon, Dr. Fang, of course, will be able to detect a problem. If she sees something that doesn't look quite right, if the scars look like they're starting to raise up, anything like that, she's at least able to do something about it at that time. So it really is a liability issue, um, and that's why we never allow a patient to leave and have someone else do that. She, she needs to do that herself. So that's a very important time. Um, let's see. How do we get scheduled with Dr. Fang? We've called in. We haven't gotten a return phone call. Okay. And again, we apologize profusely. We are being inundated with phone calls, as I'm sure you gather. And I know my staff is telling you that. And we are making every effort we can to try to reach out and get back to people. Um, of course, because of HIPAA laws, we can't leave messages, and we don't. Um, but we, we want to reach out to each and every one of you, but we felt that if we could put these webinars out there and we could provide the same information that I would be providing to you on the phone, um, we can reach more people in a shorter period of time. And then for those of you who are, who are convinced that Dr. Fang is the surgeon for you, uh, you already know all the details, you basically know how long you have to be here from start to finish, which for most people it's about five to six days total. Um, you know that she's going to do a two to two and a half hour consultation with you. We're going to do your pre-admission testing. Your medical records are important. We always would like to have copies of your medical records in advance because this is something our nursing staff will look at very closely and share with Dr. Feng so we're fully prepared for you when you arrive. Um, so we're getting this information out there in hopes that some of you will say, okay, I don't, you know, this is not a problem for me right now. I can put this off. It's okay for me to wait. Um, or you may decide, geez, Dr. Fang is booked four to five months out. I can't wait. At least you have the knowledge and the information that you can go seek someone else out. And at least maybe you'll have some more questions. You'll be able to ask them just because we've enlightened you about this subject. Um, but if you do call back in and you've already given your information once, believe me, we have your information. Um, we have uh, probably a hundred phone messages stacked up. We will find you because we sort them alphabetically almost daily to try to keep track so for efficiency. So when you call back in, make sure you say, I watched the webinar. Um, I have most of the information. I'm just interested in looking at some possible dates and we'll be more than happy to help you. So again, thank you and uh, for your patience and, and our, our apologies. We're really not trying to neglect anyone. Um, so I think that concludes my questions for the day, unless we've gotten a few more that have come in. Alex, do you have any new ones? We do. People are wondering about securing surgery dates. About securing a surgery date. How do they do it? Yes. Okay, good question. So Dr. Fang performs surgery on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. When we schedule surgery for Dr. Feng, she only does two surgeries a day. Uh, she's very much of a perfectionist. She takes her time. As I said earlier, this is a very tedious, difficult surgery for her, and she does not like to be pressured or have any type of time constraints. So we schedule two surgeries a day. Our first patient comes in at 6.15 a.m. in the morning. Second one usually comes in more like around 11 o'clock. The surgery typically can last anywhere from two hours on the short side if we're only removing implants and capsules. But when we get into muscle repair, which I can address that with you in a moment, um, if we're doing muscle repair, uh, removal of maybe previous capsules from previous sets of implants, surgery can take a little bit longer. If we're doing a breast lift at the time of the removal, then we're looking at maybe a four hour surgery. So that's why we you know, and sometimes we don't know about the breast lift until the day before when the patient arrives. So how do you schedule? You call us up. Uh, you tell us what you're thinking about in terms of, you know, do you prefer a Wednesday or a Friday to have your surgery done? Obviously, you're coming in the day before on a Tuesday or a Thursday for the consultation, which lasts about two hours with Dr. Fang. 
followed by the pre-admission testing with our nursing staff, either Bryn or Carla, uh, surgery the next day, and then we're waiting for your drains to come out. So I say two to, I'd say on the short side, you would be here maybe um, five to six days for most people. To secure a date, we require a deposit of $1,500. Before you give the deposit, you will know the exact price to the penny because we will quote you based on what needs to be done. So again, if you need just removal, removal and muscle repair, uh, removal of uh, older capsules, uh, breast lift, anything like that, we will give you an exact price up front so you would know exactly the penny what it's going to cost you. We stand behind our pricing. No surprises when you arrive. Uh, the only additional cost that you would have would be anything done outside of our facility, which would be if you require an ultrasound mapping, which would be scheduled at the Cleveland Clinic, which is 10 minutes away from our location, and our team will be more than happy to schedule that for you. Uh, we'll get everything all set up. That would be extra. Perhaps your insurance may cover that. If they didn't cover the ultrasound mapping, it would be between $800 and $1,000. It is absolutely necessary for anyone who has gel implants even if they're the new gummy bear cohesive gel, whatever you want to call them, they still rupture, they still leak, they're still a mess when they do. So um, we have to do our due diligence and we have to do the ultrasound mapping. It is done by one particular radiologist, Dr. Leonard Kahn at the Cleveland Clinic, who we have worked with for 21 years. So he's very, very experienced and this is all about precision. We always send the implants, the capsules, and any residual silicone that may be removed, any suspicious cysts or tumors that may be found in the breast tissue or any cells which appear to be precancerous would be removed, photographed, sent to an outside independent pathology firm to be evaluated in your best interest. That also would be extra because it's outside of our facility. Pathology can be covered by your insurance. We can provide your insurance information. If your insurance did not pay, or if you don't have insurance, uh, between four and five hundred dollars, generally speaking. So those are the costs that are involved. So once we quote you a price and we determine exactly what needs to be done, and we've identified a date for your surgery and a time for your consultation the day before, we require a deposit of fifteen hundred dollars. That can be done with any major credit card over the phone: Mastercard, Visa, American Express, or Discover. You can do it with care credit if you want to spread your payments out over time. You can do a wire transfer right into our account. Um, or you can send a check. So that's how you put your deposit down to secure a date. We, in turn, will send you a welcoming packet, which will include everything that you need to make your trip very, very easy. Hotel brochure, which will give you a description, toll-free number, and pricing for many different options of hotels, motels, bed and breakfast, furnished condominiums, you name it, it's here. You pick the price range that you want to be in and what type of amenities you like. And uh, all of these facilities are within five to 10 minutes of our clinic. We're located in the eastern suburbs of Cleveland. We're 30 minutes from Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. All freeway, very easy to get to. Uh, we have, for those of you who may have uh, ply private planes, we have uh, uh, Cuyahoga County Airport, which is 15 minutes away, uh, and Burke Lakefront Airport, downtown Cleveland, which is about half an hour from here. So it's, it's very accessible, easy to get to. Um, so in your welcoming packet, you'll also have information on Dr. Fang, the forms you need to fill out and bring with you to the appointment. Uh, you'll have the food and medication list that we discussed earlier to advise you what to stay away from at least two weeks before your procedure. You'll have your surgery vitamins and supplements with instructions telling you when to start and how to take them. And let's see, you'll also have maps so you know how to get here. So that uh, should provide you with everything that you need. So that's how you get started. Um, I hope I have addressed all of your concerns. Uh, Alex, do you have any other questions? I have one more, and I think that this will finish up the webinar. Do I need okay. to hire a nurse for recovery? Okay. Do you need to hire a nurse for recovery? The answer is no. You really don't, believe it or not. Um, because of the way that Dr. Fang performs this procedure, she basically 
has found a way to minimize pain and get rid of nausea following surgery. This in itself makes for a much easier, faster, less stressful recovery for you. Um, it actually cuts your recovery time in half when you're not in pain and you're not taking narcotics uh, and you're not groggy for days afterwards because of the anesthetic gas that was given to you. So it's a much better way to have the surgery. It helps you to recover faster. Many people, especially our overseas patients, um, they do come alone because it's expensive for a ticket for a second person. They function fine. They do just fine. Um, yes, it's always better to have someone with you because after surgery, the only temporary limitation that you will have is that we don't want you to lift, push, or pull anything over five pounds for the first two and a half weeks. So it's, it, it's always better to have somebody that can move your luggage or help you out, but you can get by fine on your own. The only thing you really have to do is chart your drainage from your drains, and that's very easy. Our nursing staff will show you how to do it. We will provide you with a nice chart, which will be all broken into sections for right breast, left breast, every four-hour increments while you're awake. So it's, it's nothing that you can't do on your own. Plus, we are here in this clinic six days a week, um, so we're at your disposal. If you need anything at all, uh, you know, we're right down the street, so we can always be accessible to you to help you out. So, um, and that reminds me, our, I had one more question that I missed, and that was about people that are traveling from Europe, Australia, long-distance travelers, even California, people have asked the question, is there any risk of me flying home after the surgery? The answer is no, there really isn't. If it's a long flight, you got to move. You have to move your legs. Of course, you, you would not want to sit on a plane for a long period of time with your legs tucked under you or crossing your legs. You want to keep your legs extended. You want to move. You want to get up. You want to walk around. That's important. Movement is very important. Um, and that would really be the only risk. But again, you know, we have patients from many, many, many countries who come here and don't have a problem at all. And I would say our biggest population of patients in the United States is from California. And that's a long flight too. So they do just fine. So I want to thank you for tuning in today and uh, invite you to tune in on Saturday, August 13th for Dr. Feng's webinar, which is going to be addressing the topic of detoxification. And this is a very important topic following explantation surgery, and it's one that people always ask about. Um, again, you know, no two surgeons think alike. Dr. Feng's philosophy is very holistic, and I think you'd be very, very interested to hear what she has to say about detoxification. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, we hope to hear from you. When you call in, please let our staff know that you have seen the webinar, and uh, we'll do everything we can to address any other questions you have. Thank you and have a great day.